Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Come on, can we clap our hands and give God praise? Come on, we feel a little better than that. Come on, we give God some glory. Hallelujah. Listen, have you ever been enjoying yourself so far? My goodness, this has been an amazing clarity call. Amen. We want to first honor God for uh, the opportunity to serve you all today. And we want to give honor to Pastor Tucker. about 
how through grace, it says, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. It doesn't yeah. mean, you know, you have to put yourself down. But just don't don't get into the position of thinking you're better than anyone. Yeah. But then you don't also have to think you're lower than anyone. That's right. You know? That's and true. so it says, but to soberly think according as God hath dealt to everyone the measure of faith. So in the beginning, God give, gave everyone the same measure. And so we don't have to even tap into the comparison game if we've been given the same measure and God loves all of us the same. And even last night when Pastor, the man of God, was talking about performance, we don't even have to find ourselves performing for God yeah. when he sees us all the same and loves us all the same. And when we find ourselves in that, that performance, what's happening is, okay, I'm going to church week after week, and I'm doing the works. I'm going to prayer meeting week after week, and I'm doing the works. And so we may find ourselves having our faith in the works. That's good. And that can be tormenting and even affect our mental health. Because what we're saying is, well, church is not working for me. Wow. And so now that has us questioning God. And so when we take our faith out of the performance and out of the works and put it in God, and then we'll begin to see the manifestations because then that takes pressure off of us. You know, you take the pressure off of your own mind when you don't perform and try to get God to do basically what he's already done. Amen. And so that's what we're going to be talking about for the next few moments. Mental health and deliverance. Everybody say mental health. Mental health. And deliverance. And deliverance. Say again, mental health. And deliverance. So what the Spirit of the Lord said to me when I was in my office, um, and, and I am a counselor professionally, when I was in my office, the Spirit of the Lord was saying to me, it was never supposed to be separated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The mental health mm -hmm. and the deliverance part was, it's all oh. biblically, it's one. And actually the subject God gave me was biblical deliverance. Yes. Notice I said biblical. Because we, we have a lot of definitions of, of deliverance. We've got a lot of definitions of mental health. And what we what the, the church has done is limited the ministry of deliverance to just demons. Come out, come out, come out. Devil, 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 devil. But how many of you know everything is not a devil? Come on, now, come on. Come talk that's good. That's good. It, some, some things are not demonic. Some things is, is, is a disease. It's a mental issue. And sometimes you just need to change your mind. That is, a, that is a form of deliverance. Somebody say deliverance. deliverance. And so we got uh, to demystify it, get all the religious fluff out of it. Yeah, and so it, it, it even connects to what the man of God was saying last night, how we beat ourselves up. You know, we may open up doors where they may be through ignorance or, or voluntarily. We open up doors. And so we, uh, the religious, religious church teaches, you got this demon, you got this demon, you got this demon. And so people park in their bondage. Because it's too much work to come out. And it's too much work to come out because you're teaching me a definition of deliverance that's not biblical. So that's what we want to talk about today. So the Lord said to me in our, in our assignment is to bring us back to what he intended for this ministry and uh, for this ministry to be. What, what does the purpose of deliverance come to do? It comes to bring us to God's intent. Somebody say his original intent. His original intent. That's what the, it's not about casting. Okay, when I get free from the bondage, then what? Right. That part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After I come out of the thing that's got me bound, what's next? Uh -huh. Deliverance was always supposed to have a destination. <laughs> There's always a place to go when you when when God sets you free. Amen. You want to jump in? Because you know I can go. <laughs> it is true. Um, it, it even goes back to the, um, like when we get saved in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, people say, well, you know, um, well, to stay saved, you got to love God. Make sure you love God. Love God. I'm like, okay, well, how do I do that? And it gets to the point to where uh, there aren't enough teachers. Wow. 
And yeah. even you guys hit it today about yeah. community. Yeah. Community is so important. And um, you know, when I was doing my research, it said one of the main issues that Generation Z suffers from mental um, struggles is because they don't have a community to back them up. And even us as adults in the older generation, we need yeah, community is so important. And so, um, you know, it took my mind to the scripture that says, um, to whom much is given, much is required. And the church, we've been given so much. God has given us so much through the finished works of Jesus. And when he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us, and when he rose again, you know, he rose with all power in his hands. And he rose with life, which means that we have life more abundantly. And so now he's sitting in heaven on the right hand of God, interceding for us daily. And so we've been given so much through Jesus. So much is required of us. And so, you know, the church has to do more because Generation Z is putting that that on us. We have to do more. What can yeah. we do to serve this generation? And, you know, we, we went to a conference, YLC. That's where we actually had our first date. We went to, <laughs> we went to a, a ministry conference. And the father of the visionary of the conference stood up on the pulpit. I'll never forget it. He stood up on the pulpit and he apologized to the younger generation. He said even though he may not have necessarily did anything, he apologized on behalf of his generation for them not supporting the younger generation wow. like they should have. And there was no dry eye in the building. You know, I was crying. Everybody else around me was just sniffing. And sometimes we need that apology. Yeah. Yeah. That they didn't handle us right. They didn't teach us right. You just left us out there. Wow. You know, and so, I mean, it really goes further. You know, we need to get in the position to teach as the church and have things available for what this generation needs. Yeah. yeah. And so, that, that's the truth. God, this is so much. Why you go there? <laughs> uh, that is so true because what, what I've heard coming up in ministry is this generation is so twisted and this generation is so bound and this generation and this generation and this generation and this generation and we're always talking about what this generation needs to fix but nobody's giving language. Nobody's giving any language for the freedom that you're telling us we need. Right? And so there is a frustration because what I was hearing was tell them I'm going, in this weekend, I'm going to give you the rest of your freedom. No, 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 no. I need you to hear what I'm saying. Because we get, we get a certain measure of deliverance, and then we stop there. Yeah. And, and, and we get freedom, but then we got residue. You know, we got stuff we got to work through. And the truth of the matter is, these last two years, specifically, has, has traumatized so many of us that we have been left to deal with the, uh, okay, I'm getting loud. Sorry. We've been left to deal with this crisis has took some things from you. Yeah. Uh, the pain of what you've gone through, you have to deal with what was taken from you, what the pain did, did to you, and now you have to figure out how to move into the unknown. Yeah. And we ain't even touched the devil yet. Right. 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 So the, 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 we have to stop allowing this religious lie saying that if you go see a therapist, you're crazy. Listen, shouting, dancing, running around the church and falling out, that ain't enough anymore. I just need a few people to come on with me right here. Can I get somebody to just be real right for a minute? It's, it's, not, it's, it's not enough. I am watching people in the church, particularly in this hour, lose their mind. Singing, losing your mind. Prophesying, losing your mind. Preaching, losing your mind. And God said that there has been a strong psychological attack. I have never been under so much psychological attack prior to this conference in my life. And what the Lord told me is that many of you all came here and the enemy's been fighting you mentally. He's been fighting you psychologically. And the Lord said that there is a degree of freedom that's coming to your sight. I wish I could get somebody to believe what I'm saying this weekend. You don't have to keep shouting crazy. You 
don't have to keep, you don't have to keep, uh, as the man of God said, acting as an employee, dancing. Your, Jesus died for your freedom. Galatians 5 and 13 says we've been called to freedom, which means for the believer, freedom was never an option. Your freedom is, I need somebody to say my freedom is a requirement. As a believer, it is a requirement. It does not make sense to be saved and bound. Yeah, Amen. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, you know, and a lot of times that's what we do here is if you go to therapy or if you go mm -hmm. to a counselor, there must be something going on with you. But, you know, even we have a counselor that we talk to, you know, and it's never for you to get in a position to where you don't need therapy or counseling. And I say everything is a weapon today. Okay. If you got to pray, if you got to cast the devil out, if you got to command the enemy to stay That's under right. your feet where he belongs, if you have to go to therapy, faith in God, if you have to go to counseling, do it because it's all a weapon. Right. Nothing is so wrong, wrong if you use, you know, some people will say, well, you know, well, praying is not enough or just going to a counselor is not enough, but it actually takes everything as a strategy to use in these days and times to keep our freedom. It really does. Yeah. So you, somebody say, use your weapon. Use, use your, your weapon. weapon. God has given you what you need to maintain your freedom. Use it. And how many of you know uh, when it comes down to your freedom, the, the first step to freedom is admitting? Yeah. How many of you know you cannot be free from what you refuse to talk about? So true. Somebody say, talk about it. Talk about it. You gotta talk about it. You have to. The Bible says in Revelation 12 that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. Somebody say, talk about it. Talk about it. Don't don't let this religious church cause you to shut down. This culture, right? How many of you know there is a culture that has been created? that sings about God, preach about God, shout about God, and absolutely no relationship with the Lord wow. whatsoever. Wow. And so it's causing a frustration even with Generation Z because they can't really tell the difference. Because you look like it, you speak in tongues like it, you, you look like you've got it. But when you're at home and it's 2.30 in the morning, I've had to pray for ministers who their bishop raped them. I, I, I want to be real with Generation Z today. In, 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 in our, uh, our counseling, online counseling practice, I've had to pray with ministers who have been traumatized by spiritual fathers, leaders, mothers who promised them platforms, but you got to sleep with me to get it. This stuff is real. And we got to quit playing. We're, you know, we're in an hour where people are seeking answers. You know, you, you can't even walk out the door without worrying about getting shot in the head today. Yeah, yeah. So this is not a time to be deciding, well, do I want to park in my bondage? Do I really want to be free? No, no, no. I want you to run after your freedom. Run after I don't care who you got to leave behind. I don't care what you got to lose. Somebody shout, run! Run! We're going we to go to the scripture and And I just wanted to piggyback off of that. We really, we really have to have those uncomfortable conversations. You know, because they're real and real stuff is happening. And the thing is, we feel like we can't be real. And that's another thing. We really have to create a safe community. And let people know that you are confidential. You won't, they won't hear their business on the other side of town. You know, and so we have to have these hard conversations. It goes back to the scripture, to whom much is given, much is required. Yeah. And the church has been given so much. It's required of us to create these safe places mm -hmm. and these extra programs to come and be real and open right. yourself up. We have to have these hard, uncomfortable conversations. And it wasn't even until I even married my husband to where I realized the hard, uncomfortable conversations is what pulls the best out of you. Yes. That's what God uses. And, and I mean, you're, you're exposing yourself, every part of you, when you open yourself up and have these hard conversations. Yeah. And, you know, the Lord's even been dealing with me. You know, the Lord told me one day that I wasn't showing my oldest son enough love and compassion. Wow. And so... 
in that moment, I told him that. I said, you know what? God told me I wasn't hugging you enough or showing you, you know, the amount of love that you needed. And in that moment, it ministered to him more than me standing up here preaching because I don't want to be that mother or even that wife that stands up here and I can hear God concerning everyone else that's up for my own household. God, God, so, you know, pay attention to even if it's your parent, it may be your friends, you know, or even your children. And I let my son know that, you know, and it was uncomfortable for me to even hug my son because I didn't come from a hugging family. So, you know, sometimes we do have to have those uncomfortable, hard conversations, yeah. you know, and um, it, it, even though I didn't come from a hugging family or, you know, um, we were still close, but, you know, I was uncomfortable with hugging or I was uncomfortable with having conversations. So I told my husband, I, I'm not one to um, express myself. You know, and so we have to create these safe places in these programs. If you have to hire a counselor in your church, do it. Because pastors can't be everything to everyone. So if you have to hire help, and even as parents, if you have to hire babysitters, if you have to hire a therapist, do what you can do. We really have to get through these hard situations and deal with them. Amen. And, and Jay, you said something about how you didn't come from um, a hugging family. I didn't come from a hugging family. As a matter of fact, I'm a baby boy. I have an older sister. You know, we don't, we don't hug like, hey, how you doing? Know, we love each other, but it's just that cultural dysfunction that was taught to us. You know, this is how you just exist. And we related, we exist, and that's good. And, and so what I'm saying is there's a lot of things that we've learned from a child that we have now defined as normal. Amen? And, and our scriptural example for that is Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29, when Jesus uh, ran into the man, the father whose son was possessed. Anybody know that, that scripture? He was possessed with a, 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 a deaf and dumb spirit, and he had an a, a epilepsy disease. So uh, the Bible says that and, and we can wrap up. The Bible says that when, when Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, it was uh, Peter, James, and John, and they, 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 the man ran after him and said, listen, can, can you set my son free? I'm just going to paraphrase it. Can you set my son free? And, and the Bible talks about how Jesus cast the devil out of, him, out of the young boy, but before he did that, he gave the father therapy. He gathered information before he cast his spirit out. Go back and read this text when you get an opportunity. He asked him, how long has this child had this condition? See, if you, when you're working with a mature, skilled therapist or deliverance worker, they don't gather information first. They, they, because when, you need, when you're needing freedom from something, that's vulnerable. And the reason why deliverance ministry has been so attacked in the church is because we have people who take this ministry and abuse it yeah. and use your vulnerabilities to make themselves look powerful. Wow. My bondage is not your no opportunity to show up. I can't y'all come on. Here. I can't hear nobody saying nothing right there. If I'm telling you, and I'm just saying this, I ain't just me, I'm just saying. If I'm telling you I've struggled with homosexuality. That is not an opportunity for you to record a Facebook video in hopes to get another preaching gig and call my stuff out publicly through social media. We have a lot of immature deliverance workers and, and therapists because it seems to give you some superpower because you can help somebody come out of their bondage. And usually people who act like that really ain't free themselves. So what Jesus did I'm going to prove it to you in the text. What Jesus did is he got information. After he got the information, he said, bring the boy to me. And the Bible says that before the crowd came, he cast the spirit out of the boy. Because he didn't want him to get any attention. He cast, his, he cast the spirit out of the boy after gathering information. Because it was a dualism. It was a demon and a mental issue. It wasn't just demonic, it was mental. There were some occasions in the Bible when Jesus would cast out devils, uh, it, was, it was just a demon, but then there was other occasions where he would cast out devils and heal the sick and heal diseases. 
This, this is what you call biblical deliverance. The whole, all of it. I want the, so the Lord said, tell Generation Z, I'm giving you all of your freedom this weekend. Come on, I need somebody to receive this right now. God is giving you, somebody shout all of it. I want all of my freedom before I leave Destiny Church this weekend. So I'm closing with this. And I'll let baby have the last few words. And if we're going to release a prayer, we're going to sit down. So what? Okay, I'm good. Uh, uh, okay, so I want to prophesy this to you out of the scripture. So you won't think I'm making this up. The Bible says that when Jesus, after, after he delivered the young, the young man, he told him in the prayer, verse 25, he said, but when Jesus, Amplified Bible, when, when Jesus noticed that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you deaf and dumb spirit, I charge you to come out of him and never go into him again. Come on now. Okay. <laughs> somebody say, I'm getting ready to get a permanent deliverance. I'm going to get a permanent. Come on, I need somebody to get excited right there. Because sometimes we get deliverance and those things come back. But even if it came back, Jesus shut the door. In other words, God told me to tell somebody today, even if you open the door, the devil cannot come back because the deliverance that's going to hit you this weekend is permanent. Come on, come on. Somebody shout permanent freedom. Permanent deliverance. God is setting you free permanent. He said never go into him again. And let me tell you when you're dealing with a real deliverance minister, an authentic one. Because the Bible says after the spirit came out of the board, he lay there like a corpse. They thought he was dead. But he was free. Let me say something. Stop worrying about what people think about your freedom. Try not to take off. Say it again. Stop. They, you, they, you may look dead to them. Come on, come on, somebody. You might look dead to them, but you're free. When you've been since you were a child and you finally get freedom, I can give a nigga's worth a doggy. But you think about me, I got my freedom. So if I need to look like I'm dead to you, I don't have a problem looking like I'm dead to you. If I need to look like a corpse, I look like a corpse. As long as I am free. Somebody that can hear this shout freedom. So the Bible says they, they thought he was dead. When you deal with a real deliverance ministry, minister, the Bible says that Jesus took a strong hand yeah, and lifted him up and stood him on his feet. Let me let you know when you deal with somebody that's really committed to your freedom, they're not just going to leave you there. They're going to pick you up and stand you on your feet. And many of you all have been trying to get on your feet by people who have pushed you down.
God is lifting up your self-esteem. You're not going to keep talking negative about yourself. Stop calling yourself ugly. Stop calling yourself fat. Stop calling yourself skinny. Quit talking about you too dark, you too light. You are who God created you to be. But the crown of your head, to the soles of your feet. Somebody say, I am, I am. who God created me to be. the love of God. Come on. Wrap your arms around yourself. Wrap your arms around your flaws. Wrap your arms around your insecurities. Wrap your arms around all your issues. Come on, love on yourself. into the worship to where we made our worship about us sometimes. And that song has been in my spirit all weekend that I'm coming back to the heart of worship where it's all about you, Lord. And even last night as the pastor's wife was leading worship, she was talking about those mountains moving, even those mountains in our minds moving. And as they led worship last night, and he told us to bow down before the Lord and in the presence of the Lord, I just had the vision of people coming before the Lord and unpacking, unpacking all of that baggage in his presence. So when you don't meditate on the issues of your life when you come in worship, you're saying, God, it's all about you, and you're taking care of what's going on in my life. And so I just want to sing a little bit of that. Come on, if you know it. We're coming back to the heart of worship. Thank you. 